Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. So we're in our second week of everyday satsang. And just to remind everyone, satsang means being in reality together. So satsang is a vehicle for just relaxing and feeling more of your real nature. That's what we're doing here. If anybody has something you'd like me to talk about, please let me know. I wondered if you would talk about playfulness. I was just listening to this wonderful talk with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, and he said this thing that really struck me, that playfulness is a result of confidence in the self. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, you can't fake that. (laughs) You can't just fake being playful. So even though you can't fake having confidence in the self and becoming playful as a result, the way that you become confident in the self is by perceiving the self. And when you perceive the self directly, meaning that subjectivity that is ubiquitous, then you also perceive its playfulness and you perceive that everything is fine and you perceive that it is your real nature. So there's no such thing as perceiving the nature of reality without recognizing that it's also what you are. One of the things that we must do in order to subtleize our senses is open our channels. And there's definitely many things you can do to facilitate that. The video that I posted, that Kung Fu Qi Gong video, has a lot of hopping up and down type of movement and vigorous shaking kind of movement. It's a thing in Qigong called shaking the channels. So doing that could possibly induce more playfulness. <laughs> right now, most of us are being more still than we are when there isn't a pandemic. And this is a problem for playfulness. You know, even if we do more exercise, I know which I've I've been doing more sort of video exercise watching and following, it really doesn't substitute for getting out and about and just having more movement in our day generally. And that induces stagnation in the channels, which causes heaviness and lack of playfulness and could cause depression too. A feeling of sluggishness, discomfort, and ultimately isn't really good for our health either. So we should do more vigorous activity, but not necessarily activity that is super structured. So for instance, weightlifting is vigorous activity, but it's very, very structured. I would suggest incorporating some unstructured movement, for instance, into your asana practice or just Several times a day, doing unstructured movement, jumping up and down, hopping around, dancing, anything that you can do to invigorate. And that will help be more playful. You know what? Yesterday was one of those days where I, it was the first time I really felt extremely bored. Because I did the whole, like, information overload. I was so bored. I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't know how to process yesterday. Well, boredom, interestingly enough, is a state of energy under tension. When energy is not flowing freely, the feeling of boredom inside is like this inner shaking that can't get out. So when you feel that, Instead of thinking of something to do, again, the same advice that I gave Matri, think about doing some crazy movement. You don't have to do purposeful activity. What unstructured movement means is moving your body 
in a way that doesn't have any rhyme or rhythm, shaking things out, doing something unexpected with your body, and then jumping. So jumping is really great for getting the channels moving. And there's all kinds of other things that we can do to help that. And that will allow you to just enjoy more doing less because the energy will be moving more freely and you won't have that feeling like, uh, <laughs> you know, we think of boredom as kind of like a nothing experience, but it isn't a nothing experience. It's like a pot with a lid that's too tight and shaking inside. So we have to let the steam out of the pot. And then we can just go, ah. Also singing is good. Uh, or just making noises really loudly, letting your breath out. There's some Hatha yoga things where you just go, ha, like that. Anything we can do to let the steam out, shake up our channels is going to make that feeling of boredom go away. And then we might even discover that we can just sit peacefully doing nothing. We should also uh, maybe consider during this time why we always want to be accomplishing something. And why we think we're wasting our time if we're not accomplishing something. If we're not making progress on something or fixing something. Why do we think that we should always be doing that? Yeah, I think that's another thing too, because I see like such a proliferation of people doing things more online and offering more things. And then I'm like, wow. And then I'm like, I'm sitting here. Yeah, well... I mean, it's really wonderful that people are doing that and we have those options, but not if everyone were doing it, who would actually come together? (laughs) Right. Sometimes since we moved to the Bay area, I think to myself, there's so many spiritual teachers here. Who are the students? (laughs) Is there anybody left to be a student? I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what you've learned about the nature of reality through working with fear. Well, first I learned about fear and I learned about the difference between fear and anxiety. I learned that fear is a very alive state full of vitality. And that's part of the reason we fear fear is because it's just too alive for our sensorium to host. But there are people who really enjoy being afraid. People who do really, really scary things because they find it thrilling. And although we may not be one of those people, (laughs) if we have the opportunity to explore fear, we do discover how alive it is. It also short circuits all of our conceptual mind It short circuits our experience of linear time. It's like entering into the big nowness. When we're experiencing fear, we're not guarding against it. We can have that experience. We also can learn that it's okay to be afraid and it's okay to be uncomfortable. I was interviewed for a podcast this morning and I was saying that in a time like this, if we're working with this situation, we're bringing the circumstance onto our path. One of the things we can learn is that it's okay to be uncomfortable because our fear of being uncomfortable is one of the great obstacles for us in this period of time, in this place, in this culture. Waking up requires that we host a certain amount of discomfort at different times. It requires that we experience fear at certain times. It requires that we not know what's going to happen next and experience that uncertainty. It requires that we respect our doubts. And there are all kinds of things that we're not particularly good at or that we avoid. And I've I've certainly learned over time of working with people that sometimes people are stopped in their spiritual practice because of very minor discomforts, very minor. 
For instance, we do Nadi Shodana, which is alternate nostril breathing. And I was very surprised to learn early on teaching this practice that there were a large number of people who were afraid to suspend their breathing for any amount of time, really. You know, if they counted to four seconds, they started to feel anxiety because they weren't breathing. And there wasn't anything wrong with their lungs or anything like that. And I've run into quite a good number of people who have the sphere, and so they can't do this very beautiful, very helpful practice because they have such a fear of not breathing, which makes them feel like they're not in control and it brings up their fear of death. Just this very minor discomfort stops them. And there's so many examples of this. So now we're in a situation that for a lot of people is hugely uncomfortable. And it's a great time to realize that it's okay to be uncomfortable, that you can get through it, that you can host it, and that there's actually something of value here. And the same goes with fear. So it's not so much that I learned something about the nature of reality from fear itself. It's just fear was a gateway to opening the perceptions of reality. And there's many stories if you read in Indian traditions and Tibetan traditions, Chinese, Taoist traditions, etc., of teachers telling students to do things that will induce fear. This is an aspect of these direct realization traditions or tantric traditions. You often hear about those traditions doing sexual sadhana, but it's much, much, much more common to use fear. No one would ever come to a workshop that said, experience terror. (laughs) Have better terror. (laughs) That would be a total flop as a workshop. But there's many aspects of the practice and in your relationship with the teacher that are meant to induce small moments of shock or fear so that you can enter into a condition of non-concept mind and non-concept experience. And that these are very deliberate things. There's like specific mantras and the whole way that a teacher will relate to students in these traditions. If a student's able to host them, we'll have moments where there's some shock that the teacher delivers or that the practice delivers. So those are small things that are just kind of built into the teaching style or into the sadness that we do in a general way. But then there are also other practices that are called left-handed practices that are to induce great fear, uh, which are not given to very many students. Things like go out in the woods where there's wild animals and do meditation to get buried underground in, in graves to jump off of high walls. So lots of things come up when you do those things. And it's very interesting. There's actually some good result from doing those things if you're the kind of practitioner that can go there. But not everyone does that, and it's not necessary either. So fear is something that we practice with if we have that capacity. Oh, hi, my name is Kelly. I'm new. Hey, Kelly, new. My question has to deal with uh, children and those of us who are raising children right now. My girl is three and she's just started asking, like, why? Yeah, sure. So the first thing we always want to do is provide a feeling of a sturdy container for kids. And that container is especially important when there's unsettled times. The container can consist of lots of different things. On a very basic level, it can consist of regular meal times and healthy food so that kids know what to expect and feel nourished and like they've been thought of. I'm sure you probably know this already, but that creates a very strong container for kids. Routines, routines of going to bed, routines of eating, doing things at certain times, and having the quality of those experiences be the best that you can offer them. Then the way that we hold kids is important also. 
whether we physically hold kids, depending on what your constitution is, whatever sort of meditative or steady or sturdy or confident feeling you can have inside your body, energy and mind while you're holding your kids and giving them this very sturdy feeling when you're holding them. That's important too, especially when kids are upset or maybe you're upset to spend that time just holding them in this very sturdy sort of physical, sturdy, energetic container is really important. And other kinds of touch too that are really smoothing, like when you're bathing your kids, like these very full palm downward strokes while you're bathing them, helping them to seat their prana. You can even sit with her and just breathe. You can just say, let's just sit beside each other and breathe. Let's take some deep, slow breaths. Anything that creates this sense of downwardness and groundedness. Another thing you can do is walk with your kids and tell them that you're going to feel the bottoms of your feet while you're walking. Bringing our minds down to the bottom of our feet, touching the ground is really helpful for our internal winds and reducing fear. And you can even like stomp together and really feel the bottoms of your feet together. So all of these things are creating a container. They're creating a downward movement. They're creating a feeling of being extra cared for. For instance, if you're making meals, putting a flower on the food, you would do that at a fancy dinner party for adult, but most people would not do that for a kid. But there's no reason not to do it for a kid, right? So that even if the whole world is going haywire, that child has this feeling like their parent is totally with them and giving them everything, right? Just from a gesture like that. So these are just some suggestions, but I think you kind of get the idea. And then this is also probably something, you know, or lots of parents find out as they're parenting. When kids ask questions like, why are, are we not allowed to do this or that in this circumstance? It's a skill to sort of find how can you be honest but in terms that the child is going to be able to digest. Um, that won't be too much, that won't be overwhelming, that won't be really more than they asked, but also won't be dishonest. When I was growing up, my mom's kind of like me. We both have a lot of Jupiter qualities, a lot of optimism. I don't know what her astrology chart was, but I suspect she had exalted Jupiter because she was so over-the-top optimistic, way more hysterically optimistic than I am. <laughs> I have a lot of optimism, but my mom beat me by a mile. I remember the whole time I was growing up, there was a they, they're taking care of it. If there was a problem in the world, don't worry, honey, they're taking care of it, <laughs> she would say. <laughs> and then at some point when I got old enough, I realized, no, they weren't taking care of it. <laughs> And it was a huge, huge disappointment. And I was hugely angry about having been duped all that time. Consequently, I do feel that it is better to be honest with children about how the world is and to share your worldview with them, to share your spiritual traditions with kids. And, you know, you can always just say something like, well, there's some people who are sick and we're helping them to stay healthy by staying home for a while now, something like that. Something really simple, but not hiding what's actually happening. Every parent has to figure out what it is their kid can hear, what level of explanation is appropriate. A lot can happen in that container. A lot of sharing can happen. 